Close your eyes and imagine. What if the things in life that cause us the greatest pain, the things that bring us grief, are challenges? Challenges designed to help us grow, to ultimately become what we were always meant to be. We feel like we've been buried, but what if, like a seed, we've been planted? And having been planted, we grow to become a mighty tree. Now, open your eyes. Open your eyes to this way of viewing life. Come with me as we explore your true, infinite, eternal nature. This is Grief to Growth, and I am your host, Brian Smith. Hey everybody, this is Brian back with another episode of Grief to Growth. And today I've got with me uh, John Burke. And uh, John is an author and he's a founding pastor of Gateway Church in Austin, Texas. He's written six books, including No Perfect People Allowed and Soul Revolution. And his latest book, which we're going to talk about today, is called Imagine Heaven. And it hit number one on Amazon and is a New York Times bestseller. Um, so with that, I want to keep the introduction short because I want to have a, a conversation and let him tell the story in his own words. So that I want to welcome John Burke to Grief to Growth. Thanks, Brian. It's great to be here. Uh, yeah, you, yeah, you just froze. <laughs> okay. Oh. Uh, yeah, we're back. Uh, yeah, it's, I'm really looking forward to having this interview with you today. Um, as I was telling you earlier, what I really want to do with, with the show, with Grief to Growth, is give people hope and understanding. And I know your latest book, Imagine Heaven, is about near-death experiences, which I find to be one of the most hopeful things that people can, can kind of cling on to. But I know some Christians have some difficulties with it, so I want to get into that later on. But before we get there, I'd like to talk to you about what led you into, into the ministry in the first place. What led you to, to what you do? Yeah, well, interestingly, um, it, began, uh, it began with grief for me. I was um, an agnostic. I was skeptical uh, you know, of all the God, Jesus stuff. You know, had a little church growing up, but kind of walked away from it and just doing my own thing, partying, you know, living for me. Mm -hmm. And my dad got cancer. And um, as he was approaching death, uh, someone gave him the very first research on near-death experiences, uh, the Moody's Life After Life. And I saw it on his bed stand, his, his dresser. Hmm. And I picked it up and I just started, I began reading it and couldn't stop. And I read the whole thing in one night and I said, oh my gosh, this God, Jesus stuff may be true. Hmm. And it opened me up actually to, wow. um, because, you know, I, I, like I said, I studied engineering. I worked in engineering before going into ministry. Mm -hmm. And to me, this was evidential. It was, it was part of what I was looking for. It was like, how do you know this isn't just, you know, cross your fingers, wishful thinking. Mm -hmm. And here you have testimonies of people and what I've discovered since all over the world saying common things. And what, what I ended up doing, I mean, that began 35 years ago and it led me actually coming to faith in Christ as I started to read and study the Bible along with, I've studied over a thousand near death experiences. Mm. And so what I ended up doing was writing, um, taking the observations and the commonalities that I've found in over a thousand near death experiences and showing how this is actually what God has been telling us all along. And so I tie the two together, you know, what, what the Jewish prophets and what Jesus uh, was saying we should expect and what that kind of paints, uh, you know, I like to liken it like a, uh, a black and white drawing of the life to come and these near death experiences just color it in. Wow. And so by the end of imagine heaven, you feel kind of like you've been there because you've seen what the Bible is saying, but you see it through the eyes of people who have had near death experiences who have clinically died and come back. And yet, you know, they're, they're showing you what it's saying all along. And so, you know, for me, yeah, that, um, it, it's been a long journey and I wrote Imagine Heaven for two reasons. One, I wanted people who are still skeptical like myself to see this is evidence. This is scientific medical evidence that life goes on after this life. This is the temporary life. This is not the one we were created to live in. 
and the one to come is the one we were created to live for. And there is great hope in that. And, and the second audience I wrote for were Christians because um, I do think it's been an incredibly misunderstood, uh, what I think is actually a gift from God. I think the church in, uh, in the early days of it coming out, not understanding the mystery of it or how it ties, pushed it away. Mm-hmm. And I think it did damage. I think it, 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 it kept people from seeing um, really the hope and the beauty of, of this gift that I think God's given now to our global world to show mm-hmm. that the afterlife is real, God is real, He loves all of us, and, and He wants us to have no fear at all but hope. Yeah. Yeah, I completely agree with everything you just said. And I think I think at the end of the year is kind of like a kind of a little glimpse, a little peek behind the veil. Um, but and I, and I was so excited to, to hear about you. And I was looking at your website earlier. And I saw that you've got other Christians that are talking about NDEs, because I know there's for some people, they get pushback. Mm-hmm. I, I personally know several people that have had NDEs and are scared to talk about it in their church and been been told by their pastors that it's either hallucination or it's of the devil. Right. I know. And I think the reality is, um, I mean, I, I'm kind of shocked by it, but I get it too, because, you know, like I said, my, the beginning of my journey, I was opened up to the reality of the spiritual by looking at the first research of NDEs. Mm-hmm. Then I was invited into a, a, you know, a small group Bible study in a home and I was still a skeptic. So I was like, hey, you know what? They're not, they're going to kick me out because I got a lot of questions. I got a lot of doubts. Mm-hmm. Still, I did, you know? And, but that space allowed me, I mean, because they said, no, you know, your, your questions are welcome. Mm-hmm. By the way, it's why we started Gateway Church the way we did. I mean, our, our motto is no perfect people allowed. Mm -hmm. because there are no perfect people, you know, Um, Mm -hmm. but also doubters welcome. I mean, we created Gateway for a place where skeptics and doubters can come and explore. And we've seen people come to faith out of every imaginable religious background uh, and and agnostics, atheistic engineers like me, lots of them Mm -hmm. in Austin. And but, but what I find is when you give people the space to explore with no condemnation, with no judgment, but just to, to question and ask and wrestle, I mean, the evidence is there. And, it, and what I discovered, it's there even without NDEs. NDEs are just, they're kind of icing on the cake. There's a mm-hmm. lot of historical evidence as well, and that's what wrestling with it brought me to faith in Christ. Um, but during that time, and, and I'm talking about the 80s and, and 90s, um, more and more was being written on, on near-death experiences. But, but what was happening is people would talk about it and then they would feel uh, it wasn't well known. And so they would get people saying, well, that was probably the drugs you had in the operating room or you were just hallucinating or, oh yeah, pat on the head. You know, I'm sure, you know, I'm sure that was a, you know, a hopeful dream you had. And it's mm-hmm. a sacred experience to people. Right. Because, because what I found after, you know, interviewing so many face-to-face is they've never experienced something more real in their lives. Right. Now, mm-hmm. how do you explain that? And, and actually, I, I've come up with a, a, an analogy. It's not um, completely mine. Um, it actually comes from a book I read called Flatland. But I think it helps understand. So imagine... If this three-dimensional, you know, we live in three dimensions of space and one dimension of time, right? Mm -hmm. So imagine if we're living this life, but it's actually being lived on a flat two-dimensional black and white painting in your room, okay? And death means separation. So when we die, our spirit separates from our body. So imagine at death, then you're ripped off that two-dimensional painting and you're brought out into this three-dimensional room that was always all around you. Mm -hmm. And now you can look back and you can see your flat two-dimensional world for what it actually is, but now you're experiencing, I mean, you're yourself, but you're experiencing new dimensions of of time and space and and color. And in your world, you only knew black and white. 
Now imagine getting pressed back into that flat painting. You have to come back to your two-dimensional life right. and explain in two-dimensional language and black and white terms what three dimensions of color is like. Right, right. That's what I'm convinced that these people are trying to do. That, that truly our world is a limited version of life, limited to three dimensions of space and one dimension of time. Mm -hmm. But in the world to come, it's many more dimensions of space and time. And as a result of that, you know, people are having to, they're reporting what they experience, but they're also, all of them having to interpret it as well. And they're interpreting in their own framework. Right. So in the early days, I think what was happening is people were, were having these experiences there wasn't much known about it. In Christian circles, there had been no uh, attempt to do what I did, which is to understand, well, what would we expect from a biblical view of the afterlife, and then how does it align or differ? Mm -hmm. and, and so as a result, people would interpret their experience. So they would say things like, well, I, I left my body, but I was up in the room uh, at the ceiling, and, and I was watching what was going on and I felt this incredible peace and you know this brilliant God of light was there with me and I saw my my family members and everything was great and then I went you know I went back mm -hmm. and you know Christians wouldn't connect necessarily that there's anything biblical there they, they would have a, a lot of a different, maybe theological paradigm, but, but it's actually not a correct one, I believe. Yes. And, and here's why, uh, you know, a couple of reasons. For instance, I believe the Apostle Paul, who wrote much of the New Testament, actually had a near-death experience. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, you know, Paul, if you don't know about him, he was Saul, he was a Pharisee. So he was, he was one of the Jewish elite religious leaders who ended up having Jesus crucified. You know, so, you know, Jesus isn't all pro-religion. <laughs> Sometimes religion, you know, many people are like, ah, I'm not into religion. Well, you know, there, there, are, there are religious tendencies that, you know, will try to kill even God. <laughs> and, exactly. and it's an important thing to remember. Don't throw, just because religion goes astray, don't throw out God. Right. Don't throw out Jesus. Um, so anyway, Paul is actually persecuting Christians because he believes that, you know, Jesus was this demonic false messiah. Mm -hmm. When this brilliant God of light appears to him, sound familiar? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you know, on the Damascus Road, and right. he says, who are you, Lord? And he says, I'm, I'm the one you're persecuting. I'm Jesus. Yeah. Now, Jesus doesn't tell him, he doesn't preach at him, he doesn't tell him the gospel, he doesn't tell him what he's got to do to be saved. He doesn't tell him any of that. He says, just go to the city. And then Jesus sends Ananias to help Paul understand what Jesus did. And by the way, Paul still had a free will. Right, right. And just because you have a near-death experience, you still have a free will. And you can come back and you can seek the God of light and love, or you can go do your own thing still. Yeah. But, but here's the cool thing. So Paul then, years later, um, he's now a follower of Jesus. He goes into the city of Lystra um, in... in modern day Greece, I believe, or maybe it's Turkey. And um, he ends up, a crowd turns on him and it says they stoned him to death. I mean, piled stones on top of him until he was dead, mm -hmm. dragged him out of the city and left him as dead. And all his friends rally around him and start praying for him. And he gets back up and goes back into the city and tries again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, personally, I wouldn't go back into the city that just stoned me to death. Right, right. But, but then Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, I think is reporting on that when he says, 14 years ago, and he's talking about himself, 14 years ago, whether in my body or out of my body, I mm -hmm. don't know, but I was taken up into heaven and saw and heard things inexpressible. Mm -hmm. Now, why did he say in my body or out of my body, I don't know? Well, mm -hmm. because as Paul then later writes in 1 Corinthians 15, when we die, we're, we're buried our natural bodies, but we're raised to life as spiritual bodies. We're, we're buried in weakness, he says, but we're raised in power. Mm -hmm. 
And that's in fact exactly what near death experiencers talk about. Yeah. That they they still have a spiritual body, but with heightened senses. Not not five senses, more like fifty senses. And and I found that all of this is is in the scriptures. It's all there. But I mean, you know, not many people have really studied it. Let me give you one for example. Okay, so the heightened senses, like telescopic vision. So indie ears talk about on the other side, they could see, you know, miles, thousands of miles away, every blade of grass, every leaf on every tree in this beautiful place, you know, heaven. Mm -hmm. And... And, and so, you know, again, in the early days, I think Christians would say, well, that's weird, that's spooky, I don't get it, push it away. Yeah. But in fact, John, in the book of Revelation, so John was one of Jesus' disciples, the end of his life, he's exiled to the island of Patmos, and it says Jesus appears to him. In fact, this brilliant man of light, right? Same as what people experience all over the world. Mm -hmm. And he's taken to heaven. And he's given a vision of heaven. And he says he's taken in the spirit up to a very high mountain. Now, I've, I've had Indy Ears report of seeing this, this landscape of these incredibly high mountain ranges, higher than the Himalayas, looking down at the city of God, this, the New Jerusalem. And John is describing that. And he says that, you know, he describes the wall and the, the gates and all this. And over on the archway over them are written the names of the 12 apostles. Now, how did he read the names of the 12 <laughs> apostles from up on a high Himalayan mountain? Yeah, yeah. Heightened telescopic vision. Yes. <laughs> and there are all kinds of things like that. Communication, you know, almost a telepathic. It's more than telepathic communication on the mm -hmm. other side it's pure perfect it's it's full knowledge of everything that i'm thinking but also what i'm feeling and what you are and so there's no misunderstanding between us imagine you know and 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 yet that's exactly how um you know in in the uh hebrew prophet isaiah in isaiah 65 when it's talking about the new heavens and earth what's to come and how before they even speak, I will hear. Before the, the, the thought is on their tongue, I will answer. Yeah. It's this pure thought-to-thought, heart-to-heart communication. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I, everything you just said, I just, I, I so resonates with me. And, I, I, and it's funny because I have written in my notes, I was going to ask you about Paul on the road to Damascus. Um, because I do believe that Paul had, had a, what we would, it's kind of like a near-death experience. But I, I remember speaking with a friend of mine, he's a, he's a former pastor. He's still, you know, really into Christianity. And I was telling him, you know, I get so much comfort from studying NDEs. And his thing was kind of like, well, everything I need to know is, is in the Bible. And I don't believe these are real. And I'm, I'm like, I, I kind of do. And I said, I gave him the example of Paul. And I said, so you believe what Paul reports, right? You believe what Paul reported about being taken up to the third heaven. You believe the story about the road to Damascus, seeing the light, being struck blind hearing a voice, that sounds a lot like an NDE. And I know yeah. someone that just went through that like last week and I can talk to them. And so why do you think we give more credibility to a report from somebody 2000 years ago than from somebody that we could literally speak to right now? Well, <laughs> that's a big question that, I mean, I can't answer for everybody. Sure. But I think so let me say this i think that i think like i said ndes color in what yeah. i think that god has been revealing all along mm -hmm. so there's another there are two sides to it right mm -hmm. so one is why would you believe that ndes which are fairly recent i mean there have been there have been near-death experiences plato wrote about them um, you know, I, I've got some in Imagine Heaven from the 1800s. Mm -hmm. So it's not like these are brand new, but they have come to light with modern medicine, modern resuscitation techniques, I, you know, and, and, and so we've become more aware. Mm -hmm. But why would we think this God that people encounter all over the world, which is the same God, and it's amazing, they know him, 
And he's this God of brilliant light, of unconditional love, who knows them intimately, personally, and loves them regardless of all their junk, right? And so why would we think that that God has only revealed anything about himself to us in our last 50 years? Yeah. yeah. He hasn't. Right, right. So that's, that is an, an equal, like to throw away what God has been revealing all along, which like I said before, I found great historical evidence. In fact, I couldn't help myself, but in the appendix of Imagine Heaven, I put the historical evidence because I, I put a whole appendix on what actually convinced me about Jesus revealing the God of light and love. Mm -hmm. Because he, God said historically, look, here's what I'm going to do. And we have proof evidence that we found in the Dead Sea Scrolls that it was written before it actually happened. Because we have, we have copies of 38 out of 39 books of the Old Testament predating Jesus. Mm -hmm. One is the entire book of Isaiah, the entire thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's amazing. I won't get off on that because it's a different <laughs> subject. But I geek out on it because it convinced me in my engineering mind, oh my gosh, okay, God told us how we could know it's really him, and he wrote it into history, and this is verifiable history. Yeah. So, so that convinced me that, okay, Jesus really did come to reveal the heart of God in a form we could relate to. And the reason is, and this is the biggest, I, I think the biggest misunderstanding of God is when people think that what God mainly wants is our moral obedience. Mm. Now, don't misunderstand me. He does, because when we go against God's will, we're going against the will of love. And the only one who understands how it all works together, mm. right? Mm -hmm. and, and yet, God does allow that. He allows all kinds of evil in this world, all kinds of brokenness. So the question is, why? Because if, he, if what he wanted is just for us to do what he says, he could make us. Right, right. He could. He's God, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So why doesn't he? Well, because God is love. And what he wants more than anything are children who love him. Mm -hmm. That's what he's actually doing, I believe, in this world. He's creating a family of free will spiritual creatures who get the taste for a short amount of time. And by the way, remember, we, we're created, I believe, with 50 to 100 senses. He's limited it to five hmm. Hmm. for a season, for a time, 70, right. 100 years at best. And we are born into the knowledge of both good and evil. Mm -hmm. We experience both. We experience a taste of heaven. We experience a taste of hell. And it's a time of choosing. Mm -hmm. And I believe choosing, will we seek God? Will we love God? Will we follow God? Or will we play God? And by the way, I think every sin and every act of evil, and I think the Bible t says this, is that, it, it's all rooted in me wanting to play God rather than let God be God. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, and by the way, this is a struggle all of us have right. still. I mean, I've been a pastor, you know, almost 30 years now, mm -hmm. and I still struggle waking up every day, just thinking about what I want, what I want to get done. How am I going to get my will done? How am I going to get everyone else to do my will too? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And how much do I think about, well, God, what's your will in this situation? What do you want? Right. And am I willing to be willing and, and follow your guidance? And, and that's a struggle for all of us. Yes. Yes, it is. Swedenborg calls it the love of the self and the love of the world. These are the, mm -hmm. these are the two things that lead us to. It's, it's the love of the material and the love of, you know, basically worshiping myself over putting myself above everyone else. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's really interesting as I listen to your, your story and how you came to Christianity. It sounds like you were an, an adult when you came to Christianity, pretty much. Is that correct? I was young. I mean, I was still young. I was, I was, you know, when I was really, you know, when, when I was still skeptical, like I, I came to a point of, okay, I, I think this Jesus stuff is true. Mm -hmm. 
but I was still in my engineering days, I still had a lot of questions. And so I was wrestling, wrestling, trying to understand how does this really make sense? Yeah, I guess what I was going to get at, because I was, I was, my grandfather was a pastor and his parents mm. were pastors. So I was raised in the, in the church and we were taught not to question. We were taught just to take what we were told and the Bible is all you need. And so that's, that's the background I come a, from. Which is funny because I mean, if you read the Psalms, if you read Lamentations, they are full of like, God, where are you? What yes. are you doing? Are you just going to let evil pile on me? When are you going to bring me justice? You know, I mean, it's like John the Baptist, right? Mm -hmm. Like he, he says, oh, here is the Lamb of God who is going to take away the sins of the world. Speaking of Jesus, mm -hmm. right? I must become less while he becomes more. Okay, great, 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 John. Then he gets put in prison and he's right. facing being beheaded and he's doubting. He's doubting everything. And he sends his, you know, his disciples to Jesus and goes, so are you the one or should we be expecting someone else? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> How about Jesus? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Mm-hmm. How about Jesus struggling? That was on the cross. How about Jesus in the garden? Like, you know, I don't want to go through this. Yes. See, and, and that's the that's the hope, really, is that, you know, what near-death experiencers experience is this God of love, and the love is unconditional. Mm -hmm. Well, how can God's love be unconditional when there's so much injustice and evil in the world? I mean, yeah. he's either in, he's either not just, or he's got another way of taking care of it. Right. And that's what he was claiming to do in Jesus, that, that God would reach his arm. In other words, Jesus was not the full revelation of all there is of the infinite God. I mean, Isaiah, you know, in, in Isaiah 53 is a, a prophecy, like I said, written before it ever happened. Mm -hmm. And he says, the arm of the Lord you know, Jesus is the arm of the Lord reaching in and it, it foretells everything that he's going to be crucified for our sins because all of us like sheep have gone astray and that he's going to be buried with the, the um, thieves and robbers, but also with the rich. Joseph mm -hmm. of Arimathea, a rich Pharisee, gave him his tomb. That's why he was buried in a tomb, which was mm -hmm. a wealthy man's grave, and that he would see the light of life, that he will be resurrected. It's all in Isaiah Proof positive written before it ever happened to Jesus. Now, I think the whole reason God did that is because if we're honest with ourselves, we all know we screw up. We're all screw ups. I mean, just stop and think about it. Like, have you ever said, I'll never, but you did? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So I don't even keep my own moral law. So why would I think I keep God's? Mm -hmm. And by the way, interestingly, the moral law is what all the religions of the world have in common. I've studied right. all the world's religions. Right. And when, when people say, well, don't they basically say the same thing? Yes, they do about right and wrong, about the moral law. Mm -hmm. The problem is, what does that mean? <laughs> so we've always known basic right from wrong, and yet look at the history of humanity. Mm -hmm. Right? For, for, for all history, we... we we go against what we know is right and wrong. The question is, well, what does God do with that? Hmm. And too many times, I think we believe the lie of evil, which is that God hates you. God is judging you. He's condemning you unless you get your act together and prove you're good enough. You know, you're cast out. Right. But Jesus came to tell us the opposite. That no, God actually understands he understands every temptation. He understands every struggle. And he's actually in it with you. And he has paid the price to forgive us everything we've done wrong, past, present, and future. Hmm. Now, I'll tell you, when I first heard that, my thought was, well, that's not fair. Like, that doesn't make any sense. You're saying a murderer can just, like, say, hey, I believe in you and be forgiven and yet, you know... A good person not? I mean, what? where's the fairness in that? Mm -hmm. And again, I, I, I think we're missing the point, is that what God has actually done is remove every barrier between every person and himself, except one, our pride.
Mm. Okay. So if we want to be self-sufficient and say, I don't need God, my will be done, I think it, I think it breaks God's heart. But I think ultimately he says, okay, I'm not going to force you. And, and, and by the way, hellish NDEs actually validate this. Hmm. How so? Well, I mean, you know, uh, there have been multiple studies done, and uh, in, in one done by IANS, uh, 23% of people who came forward reporting NDEs actually had hellish ones. Uh, a, a more recent study has indicated could could be even more. Now, hmm. what does that mean? Well, I've, I've spoken with people who in Jesus' presence were were shown both and it breaks God's heart. Hmm. It's never his will. Jesus said, you know, uh, hell was not created for people. It was created for angels. In other words, angels are just, they're just another species of God's creation, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, God's incredibly creative. If you think about it, he's created, I mean, we've only categorized, I think, 2 million species on planet Earth, but we have a feeling because of how many we find every year, new species, that they're probably 7 million. Yeah, yeah. That's crazy. Think it how is. creative. Yeah. So angels are just another species, just like us, that God created. They're eternal, though. They're not, they're not born into this world, mm -hmm. but they had a free will. And so they were created to love and, and experience God with a free will. And, and love is the highest of God's creation because God is love. And yet it says that uh, some of the angels turned from God hmm. and decided, I know best, my will be done. Now, you know, in the Bible, those are evil spirits. But they're angels. Mm -hmm. They're just, they're not, they're not God. Like Satan isn't like God. He's created. Mm -hmm. God's allowing it for a time. Now, here's an interesting thing that I realized with near-death experiences is just about every near-death experiencer that encountered angels knew that they had two, usually, guardian angels. Hmm. And those angels weren't only there to, to protect them or to minister to them. They were also there to record their lives. So many of the life reviews that people got like Jesus would say to the angels, like I'm thinking about Howard Storm, um, who, who actually was a college, a tenured college professor, atheist, who did have a hellish experience, but in it, he cried out to Jesus to rescue him. And into this outer darkness comes this brilliant dot of light that grows brighter than the sun. Arms reach out, grab him, take him, pull him out of there. And then he said, the angels showed Howard his life. So they showed what, and so this panoramic reliving, like a, a, a life review. By the way, I'm making assumptions that a lot of your listeners know a lot about this. Oh, they probably uh, do. Yeah, they do. Okay, so stop yeah. me. I can explain more. Yeah, like, what's do. a life review? <laughs> mm -hmm. But the, that the angels are recording that. And here's why, I believe. Because those angels are still innocent. They're like innocent little children hmm. who have not, they've not been damaged by evil yet. Mm -hmm. They haven't been, become distrusting and calloused and cynical. They are completely innocent. But the Bible says angels long to look into these things. Well, what things? Well, the redemption of humanity. In other words, we start with the knowledge of good, but you know, God's good gifts of love and joy and kindness and, you know, selflessness and beauty and you know every every good thing mm -hmm. but we also experience the the breakdown of that we'll get back to grief to growth in just a few seconds did you know that brian is an author and a life coach if you're grieving or know someone who is grieving his book grief to growth is a best-selling easy to read book that might help you or someone you know. People work with Brian as a life coach to break through barriers and live their best lives. 
you can find out more about Brian and what he offers at www.griefdegrowth.com, www.grief, the number two, G-R-O-W-T-H.com, or text GROW, G-R-O-W-T-H, to 31996. It's interesting, right? Yeah, yeah. People talk about how time just worked differently on the other side. Yeah. But for eternity, we'll choose to love God. And see, love, you can't have love if you don't have free will. I mean, let's say you come to love someone. I, I, I love this woman, right? I want her to love me and marry me. I can't force her, though. Right. I mean, you know, I could, I could hold a gun to her head and say, marry me. Mm -hmm. And I could make her go through the parrot the motions. But we all know if I'm forcing her free will, it's not the real thing. Right, right. And I believe that is why God, you know, he, he gives us good gifts. But even his good gifts don't necessarily lead us to follow him. You can't force love. And so that's why God, I think, it remains a bit hidden in this time as well. We, we are learning why and how the will and ways of God and his love is the best way. Yeah. So we'll forever choose that. So let's, let's talk about a couple of these, of these concepts. I do want to talk about like what, what is heaven like, what awaits us. And now I want to frame this in terms of I've known people that have been in church their entire lives and they read the Bible and they, they read things like milk and honey. And they're like, I don't like milk and honey. I'm going to sit on a, on a cloud and play a harp. I don't know where they came from. It's not in the Bible, but we all think that, right? Eternity is a long time. I, that sounds boring. It sounds, so, yeah, exactly. yeah. So what can we learn from the NDE about what it's really like? Yeah. And I mean, that is exactly what I was trying to do in Imagine Heaven is show that, in fact, many Christians don't know what the Bible says mm -hmm. about what's to come. And these NDEers, um, what they are commonly reporting fits perfectly. I mean, I, I, I came up with 43 uh, descriptors mm. from NDEs of the life to come. The Bible talks about 43 of them. Wow, wow. Yeah, I mean, it's there. It's right. all there, and it's incredible. So, um, yeah, so let's talk about a, a typical NDE, right? So they leave their bodies, they, they're still themselves, right? So they're sitting there and they're watching everybody work on them and they know I've died, but they're not panicked because it's like, I feel better than I've ever felt before. I'm mm -hmm. more myself than I've ever been before. And then many times they'll have deceased loved ones meet them, right? They recognize each other, you know, it, it, it's life. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes they're wearing, I mean, I, I think about this bank president. I interviewed Marv Besteman and he said, I was, I was dressed in my favorite golf shorts and, and, you know, t-shirt. And, uh, and he said, you know, there at the gates of heaven, he sees people from every tribe, tongue and language. And some were dressed in their, you know, native garb from their culture. And so we're ourselves. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the big fears people have is, you know, I'm not going to be myself. No, the whole point of this earth is we're learning something to take with us into the life we were intended to have. Mm -hmm. So we still have our memories. We hug, we kiss, except it's deeper. It's, it's more than what that means here on earth. Mm -hmm. um, we communicate with one another, like we said before, but it's pure communication. You know, we, we struggle in this life because our minds go four times faster than our words can go. So, right, right. you know, you're listening to me, but you're thinking about three, three other things with my one. <laughs> and so, you know, I wish what I could do is just put all the things I have in my head. I'm trying to get out through my words directly into your mind. Right. Right. Well, guess what? In heaven, you can't. And, and, and so there's, there's pure communication. So there's no misunderstanding. And all of it is connected with, with the love of God. And people then often travel, and some talk about traveling through, some call it a, a dark tunnel, some it's a light tunnel, some it's not a tunnel at all. Um, some it's like a pathway through 
space. In fact, they can look back and see the earth going away behind them. And, you know, it, it seems like they're, they're going through physical space, but in another dimension. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the travel is different. Sometimes people are just boom, instantly there. Mm -hmm. But they, they come to a place that is not unlike earth. It's gorgeous. Mountains and trees and flowers and grass and fields and you know, palm trees. And, and by the way, all this is in the Bible, in the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. You know, it says uh, John is, is, is looking at, in heaven and it says that um, people from every tribe and tongue and nation and language. So think about that. They're all there. Yeah. Somehow God got them all there, yeah. right? Yeah. And they are holding palm branches, you know, and, and waving palm, well, palm trees in heaven? Yeah. Yeah. And I had a blind kid that, you know, reported his experience and blind people, when they die, they can see. Right. And he was talking about these gorgeous palm trees outside this wall with light coming out of it. Now, here's another fascinating thing. In, in heaven, it's this beauty, just like earth, but unlike earth too, like far beyond it. Mm -hmm. So for instance, people around the globe talk about light, the light of heaven comes out of everything. Right. It comes out, so Vicki is another blind person that I wrote about in Imagine Heaven. And she said, you know, light was coming out of the grass and out of the trees and out of the birds and even out of the people that came to, to greet her in this beautiful garden-like place she was in. Mm -hmm. Now again, so in the old days, Christians not really studying about this might go, oh, that sounds new agey, people of light and all this, and they would just push it away, right? right? right. But check this out. So first of all, in Daniel uh, chapter 12, I believe, maybe it's chapter seven, Daniel has a vision with an angel there and, and the angel says to him that in the last days, people, when, when, when everybody has died, they will be raised. And those who lead many to righteousness will shine like the stars in, in the heavens. Mm -hmm. Jesus said the same thing in Matthew 13. He said, then the righteous will shine like the stars in the kingdom of their father. Mm -hmm. It's there. Right. So people that this light comes out of. Now check this out. In Isaiah chapter 60. So, so remember, Isaiah is a Jewish prophet writing in 680 BC. Okay, now John is a disciple of Jesus writing the book of Revelation in about 100 AD. Right. So we're talking about almost 800 years apart. Right. And yet John and Isaiah are saying the same thing. So Isaiah says, in heaven, there is no sun or moon, for God is its light. Yeah. This is Isaiah. And then John sees the same thing. And he says, there was no sun or moon, for the glory of God was its light, and the Lamb was its lamp. Jesus, the Lamb was its lamp, and the nations will walk in that light. This is Revelation 21. Mm -hmm. In that light, meaning the, the, the light is, is coming out of everything. Now, what is the light? The light is the glory of God. And, and what does that mean? I mean, and quite honestly, this is where near-death experiences help me understand some of the things in the Bible that the Bible said, but I had a completely different understanding. Right. Mm -hmm. Right? So glory, it's like, I don't know, you know? Yeah. But, but here, here's what it, it, it is. The glory of God is the love and life and light of God mm -hmm. that gives light and life and, and love to everything, everything he's created. And that light comes out of everything. It fills everything. Yeah. And it, it makes complete sense of when Paul said, you know, in, in Romans chapter eight, he said, I believe that what we suffer in this life is nothing compared to the, the glory we will experience to mm -hmm. come. And he said, we will share in the glory of God. Yeah if we share in his sufferings. Yeah.
Yeah, now think about that. That means imagine the love and life and joy of God flowing out of you. Right. It's what we all want. Right, right. And the, and the thing is, and this is what NDE ears tell us. This is why I think it's so important to, when you hear their messages, because they, they will tell us everything, no matter how bad it looks here, everything is okay. Everything is, it's, it's all going to be okay. It's all going to be worth it. You just, just hang in there. It's going to be okay. And sometimes it's, it's hard or in this world to, to realize that, but someone that gets that little peek and, and gets to look ahead a little bit can come back and tell us, yeah, I'll, everything this, this is saying is real. And I, and I, I love the fact that you not only allow people to question, but you encourage people to question. I went through, I told you I was raised like, don't question, but then I went through a real crisis of faith and I'm an engineer too. So oh, I'm like, I, I want to know, yeah, I'm, my, I'm, my degree is in chemical engineering. Oh, awesome. So I, I always want to know, how does this work? You know, yeah. how does it work? And I saw- Shut up and don't ask doesn't work for us, does no, it? No, not at all. <laughs> so I was looking at your page early and I saw Lee Strobel had written, you know, a, a, a endorsement of your book. And I read Lee Strobel's book, you know, years ago when I was going through this and I, yeah. and I studied and I read, I read um, a guy who was a cosmologist, you know, writing about things. I read- Hugh Ross? A guy that, yeah, Hugh, yeah, Hugh Ross. And I read- oh, Yeah, I know uh, Hugh. Yeah. Oh, do you? Okay. Oh, yeah. We've spoken together and stuff at conferences. So, and... yeah, I, I wanted to break all this stuff down. I really wanted to know. And it's come to the point, uh, I mentioned Swedenborg earlier. There's a guy named Emanuel Swedenborg. I've studied, I studied a lot. Him. And Swedenborg really helps me to understand what does the Bible really mean when it says this? And so I've come to a different understanding of the Bible than a traditional Christian has. Mm -hmm. But to me, it's just become much more rich, you know? And then, as I said, I, I read Paul's account now on the road to Damascus, and I'm like, that sounds a lot, like, a lot like an NDE to me, you know, mm -hmm. that Paul had this experience where it was like, that sounds just like what an NDE is. So it all ties together. And you mentioned earlier, the, the moral thread that runs throughout religion, C.S. Lewis called it the Tao. Yeah. And he says the Tao is, it's older than the Bible. It's, and it's universal. It is. So all the stuff is just, like I said, it's really exciting. me, And I'm really excited to talk to someone who can tell people it's okay to question it's it's not only okay god gave you a brain for a reason you don't have to check your brain at the door when you walk into church no and and in fact now cynicism and skepticism can also become a faith yes absolutely And that's an important thing to realize like you can get your identity from i never land anywhere mm -hmm. but that means you're just landing with self at the center right that's a dangerous place to stay but that doesn't mean questioning and doubting and wrestling to try to say, okay, I mean, look, ultimately, we all have to trust in something. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we're God. We know everything. You know, so, so even to an atheist, I would, I would say, okay, let's just say that on this table, you know, say we're sitting at a table, on this table represents all the knowledge of the universe. Everything you can know about you know, how every system of the human body works, everything you can know about the millions of species we haven't even discovered yet on planet Earth, mm -hmm. everything you know about life throughout the billions of stars and galaxies of the universe, you know, and how it all fits together. So it, all that knowledge is on this table. How much of that, just draw a little circle or a big circle representing how much of it you understand currently. Mm -hmm. And if, you know, unless they're crazy, they put a dot. Right, right. And I say, okay, then isn't it just possible, and I'm saying just possible, that outside your realm of knowledge, in all the knowledge of the universe, God does exist. And I mean, it, it quickly moves atheists to at least agnostics. Like, well, okay, maybe, I just don't know. And that's more honest. Right. Right? right. Right. And, and, and I, I actually, I, I respect agnostics who say, you know what? I just don't know. And quite honestly, I don't care. Hmm. I mean, at least you're being honest, right? Yeah, exactly. It's yeah. like, okay, so it doesn't really matter how much evidence there is. You don't care. Well, that's a, that's a different deal, right? Right. Well, I don't, <laughs> I'm just thinking, how can you honestly say you don't care about who you are, where you came from and where you're going to? I mean, there's like the most well. But see, I think, you know, and having wrestled with this myself and then tried to help so many skeptics and doubters over the years, mm -hmm. here's what I've come to is we do care. That's part of the issue. Right. We, 
we are always seeking our identity. Like, who am I? Prove myself, prove my worth, prove I'm lovable, prove I'm valuable. And so we get very rooted into those things and it's terrifying to let go of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, so, so, you know, for, for many years, I mean, I was an, I was a magna cum laude engineer, you know, who could make my way and I was going to start my own company and, you know, all the material trappings to prove I'm valuable. I'm Mm -hmm. worth something. Right. Well, I'll tell you, you know, when I started to, when at first I started to realize this is true and nothing's more important. It, it, it's what gives context and makes sense of all that we're going through in this life. Right. But then I had an internal battle going on because my identity was all wrapped up in other stuff. Exactly. And, and quite honestly, that was a, that was a long, when I, when I felt like God was saying to me, I created you to teach others what you're discovering, not just for yourself. Hmm. And that meant, you know, and I tried to do it while doing engineering and I was just burning myself out. And when I, when I sensed him saying, no, I I want you to do this, it was Hmm. terrifying to me. Mm -hmm. And so, so my point of all that is, and, and this is an important lesson indie ears come back with, right? Is many times, all of a sudden the material things, all the proving yourself to other people things, all that doesn't matter anymore. Right. They, they have a, a real clear sense that God is love and what matters most to God is how we love one another, how we treat one another, and then how we use all the gifts and resources we've been given to, to make a difference you know, for humanity. And so many indie ears come back and they'll, they'll change professions many times into more of a, you know, a healing or a, a care profession. Now that doesn't mean always, and it doesn't mean those other professions are bad. Right. You know, I have friends who are CEOs that went through um, near death experiences and they came back and they're still CEOs, but it really changed their view of what they were trying to do. In other words, instead of just running this company, and using people to make more and prove, you know, I'm a great CEO, suddenly Mm -hmm. they started to care about the people and realize, well, the company's there for the people, not just my ego. So it does, you know, it it changes our perception of what are we here for and what what really are we trying to do? Yeah, absolutely. And I wanted to say something, you you mentioned earlier, skeptics and cynics, and I, I always differentiate between the two because a skeptic is someone who takes a while to make to come to a conclusion, but they're open to the evidence. Yeah. A cynic is a different thing. A cynic is someone that says that's impossible. I don't care. I don't believe it. And I, and I think those people are often, and I, I, I don't mean to be judgmental, but they're often caught up in themselves, and and they don't want to see that there's anything greater than themselves. They don't want to acknowledge that they don't that they don't know everything. So they just say that's that's impossible. And I found with myself trying to not trying to convince people because I can't convince people of anything, but present evidence to people. Right. I've had people come to these cynics and say, there's no evidence for any of this stuff. It's just wishful thinking. You're, you're making it all up. And I'm like, right. go read this book. Go read this book. You know, I, I said, I read, read Lee Strobel and all those guys, you know, many years ago. And now Gary Schwartz, who studied, you know, different things of the afterlife. There's so much evidence. There is. And so when I hear someone say there's no evidence, I'm like, you're just, you just don't want to see it. You, you literally do not want to see it. You're just walking around with your fingers and your ears and your eyes closed. Well, and you know what I've found, Brian, I've actually, I've actually found a place of, of compassion Mm -hmm. for those people. And, Mm -hmm. and here's why, because, um, those that did start out cynical, and, and yet were able to actually start to address it and be honest and, and, and come out of it, what I found is at the heartbeat of it almost always is hurt. Yeah, yeah. They were wounded by evil. Um, they were disappointed with God early on, many times. Um, and they never got over it. Yeah. And as a result, they built a, a wall around their heart to protect their heart and to make a life with, without, without having to face the disappointment they felt with God. And yeah. so they just write God off. 
and then and then find reasons to make sure this this worldview stays intact. Yeah. Now they would claim the same thing about us, of course. Well, you know, the, a lot of times, and it's it's the old it's the it's the theodicy argument. It's like if God is infinitely good, then there shouldn't be evil in the world because if God were infinitely good, He would solve the evil in the world. So therefore, there must not be a God because this stuff is happening. Um, which seems on the surface like a logical argument until you really start to understand what's really going on. Well, right. And that's exactly why I think what God did through Jesus is so important. Mm -hmm. Because if, in fact, um, what Jesus was saying and came to do was, is true, God is love. He has given us free will because what he wants more than anything is a loving family. That that's what Jesus was doing. He was paying for all the wrongs so that all it takes for someone to be made right with God, no matter what they've done, is just a heart turning back to him. Mm -hmm. Like how, how much more simple can it be? You don't have to jump through a bunch of religious hoops. You don't have to prove you can get clean or sober or, and by the way, I mean, this is what, this is what so many addicts have found, right? Mm -hmm. who have who have gotten sober from I, mean, I have a friend who had a 38 year meth addiction one of our pastors 10 year meth addiction mm. but it was when they came to the end of themselves and said i can't do it god help me yeah. they turned to him yeah. and they found the power to overcome and that's aa you yeah, know that's exactly. NA. that's so it's, a, it's it's all the same principles there but um you you were just saying something that um Remind me what you just said, because I had a, I was going somewhere and I derailed. Well, we were talking about the fact that these people have taken this on kind of as an identity, as a, as a pride thing. Um, so they, oh, yeah. de they decided that there can't be any God because there's, you know, there's evil and, and they're just not going to let go yeah, of the that. Yeah, the theodicy argument. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, that neglects what God has been saying all along, because to Moses, the greatest commandment, love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. So mm -hmm. love is what it's all about. That's what he said. The Ten Commandments are, the first six are how to love God, the, or the, la the first four are how to love God, the next six are how to love people. You know? And mm -hmm. it's just defining what love is not. You know? Right, But it right. can't help us love. So, you know, don't, don't hit your child. Okay? That's a command. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't keep the rage out of your heart that needs to be cured so you won't react and hit your child. Right. So what will help that? Well, if the problem, in fact, is that we're disconnected from the very source of love and light and life, right? The glory of God. Mm -hmm. Then that's what we need. We need to be reconnected to the source. And this is exactly what Jesus said. Jesus said, you know... Um, I have not come to abolish the law and the prophets, meaning the Old Testament and, and what was written there. I've come to fulfill it. Mm -hmm. well, what does that mean? Well, then he goes on. This is in Matthew chapter 7. And he, and he says, you know, the law says this, but I say. And what he's saying is the law says don't murder someone. But I, but I say, meaning I've come to help you not even hate your brother. Right. Not say right. raka. It's a, you know, cuss your brother out. Why? Mm -hmm. Well, because you don't murder someone unless there's something going on in your heart that would actually hate them to that point. And so Jesus is, his whole point was he's come to reconnect us to the God who loves us and is always with us. And that's what he said. I'm with you always. That's what yeah. the ears tell us, right? God, God tells him that message over and over. I'll, I'll always be with you. And he's there to help us in our time of need. And as we learn to walk with God in this very personal way, he actually starts to grow our hearts from the inside out. And that's what Jesus was saying. So, you know, he, 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 he made it real simple. His last night on earth, he said, guys, um, look, I'm going away. But don't worry. You trust in God. Trust also in me. In my father's house are many dwelling places. And I'm going to prepare a place for you. He's talking about heaven. Mm -hmm. And he said, I'm going to come and get you. And you'll always be with me where I am. And we're going to eat and we're going to drink wine. We're going to, it's life. I mean, it's all, it's all life, but so much more life. Mm -hmm. And then he said, 
I'm like the vine and you're like the branches. And a vine, all it has to do is stay connected to the trunk of the tree and it fruit grows naturally. Right. Disconnected from the tree, nothing grows. Right. And so he said, you stay connected to me and you will bear fruit. And what do you mean? Well, he said, the fruit of the spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and self-control, you know, faithfulness. And so that is actually, I think, Christianity at the core. Mm -hmm. It's not trying to be a good moral person. It's not trying to do the religious deeds. It's actually this incredible, beautiful thing of turning back to God and knowing that we're not condemned. There is no condemnation. God's paid for all our wrongs so that we can just like, I mean, it doesn't mean we won't do wrong, but when we do wrong, we start to realize why it is not God's will because it either hurts us or hurts someone else. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to. So we just reconnect. We stay connected to the source. And that I find is how people actually, they actually grow into the kind of life giving people we all want to be and we all want to be around. Yeah. Yeah, Now the difficult thing is that there are a lot of people who sit in churches for years and and they're actually playing the Pharisee game. I wrote a whole book called Unshockable Love about this because, Mm -hmm. oh yeah, because I'll tell you, Brian, I mean, Pharisaical Christians almost destroyed this beautiful thing I saw God doing in our church, Mm -hmm. where people from every background and walk of life and struggle, you know, were, were coming and finding love and acceptance and freedom and god Mm -hmm. was actually doing something in in not just them me and all of us right Mm -hmm. it's it's beautiful Mm -hmm. but you know i i i did find not many but christians who would would grow up in a different culture Mm -hmm. that quite honestly what what i did is i was just showing here's the culture of the pharisees that crucified jesus here's the culture of jesus Mm-hmm. Are your attitudes and actions more like the Pharisees or more like Jesus? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, we're the same people that we, that we were back then at the core, right? Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually a point I just made to someone literally like last week, you know, I, and I, and I've seen that, um, I, when I, I used to have a blog and I called it the, the church of the latter day Pharisees or the cold peas. Um, because I, unfortunately there's a lot, there's, there's a lot is relative. There is some of that in Christianity today. And a lot of people will read the Bible and they think they're, they're the cult of Jesus. They're actually in the culture of the Pharisees. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's, what's turned a lot of people off. So I, I love, I love your heart. I love your encouraging people to question. I, I love the fact that you're saying, you know, study these, these NDEs, these will actually validate what the Bible says, they'll, they'll bring it more to life. And I, and I, I get so disappointed. And I, like I said, I was talking to a friend of mine when he said, well, everything I need to know is in the Bible. I don't need to read any other book. Cause I was asking, have you read this book? Have you read this? No, I just, I read the Bible and the Bible is great, but you know, it was written 2000 years ago and there are things now God is still speaking. I, I was part of the uh, United church of Christ for a long time. And one of the things I love about them is it said, God is still speaking and never place a period where God has placed a comma. There's God's still talking to us. And through these NDEs, for whatever reason, you know, it's, we say it's medical resuscitation. Maybe it's because we need it more. You know, maybe, maybe God's saying you guys need some help. So let me give you these, these messages. And I, I look at people that have NDEs to me, they're kind of like prophets. I mean, they come back and they said, they're, they're like, you know, the uh, guy that went to the mountaintop and looked over in the promised land and said, let me tell you, I've seen it and it's real and, it, and it's there and we're headed there. Um, I, I think it's, it's awesome. So I, I, I applaud you for what you're doing. Well, and I, and I totally agree with, with maybe one caveat. And, mm-hmm. and here's the caveat is another commonality of NDEs is that they experience a border or a boundary. They knew Mm -hmm. they couldn't cross over and still come back to earth. And this is incredibly common. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, God will tell them like, what do you want to do? And they, and they know, and it's interesting because the border or boundary is different for each person. It's, Mm -hmm. It's represented in a different way, but they intuitively know 
that's crossing into eternity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what that means is we can't just study NDEs and get a full understanding right. of what's beyond that border or boundary. Right, right. And Jesus alone claims that he came from there to reveal things to us. So mm -hmm. I do think, I do think, start with Jesus. Start with Jesus and then work out from there. Mm -hmm. And as you study the NDEs, you, you know, the other thing you'll realize is they, there are they're reporting again they're reporting something truly like trying to talk about three dimensions of color in two dimensional black and white terms right right so that means everyone is interpreting as well exactly and their interpretations are not all the same yeah yeah and, and, and yeah so so anyway that's you know I, I i like to think about it like the first question really um and and i say this because of all the evidence, is who is Jesus? Did he really reveal God in a form we can relate to? Yeah. And, and answer that question first, and then work out from there, and you'll start to see that, you know, one, don't put him in a box, and I think that's what you're saying, mm -hmm. is that, yeah, I so I believe that God has really revealed what we, the basic things we need to know about who God is, who we are, and and God's characteristics in the Bible. I, I do. And, and it's through history. However, there is way more truth to be known. God didn't put every truth in the Bible. In fact, I think it's Deuteronomy 29, 29. He said, you know, the law has been given so that we can know and, and understand these things, but the mysteries of God have not been given. Mm -hmm. So there's more truth, right, right? I mean, you know, we a science has taught us. I, I was I was a, a mechanical engineer and a geologist, so mm -hmm. you know, it's like I um, when when I hear Christians talk about things like you know the Bible's all the knowledge we need, and they they basically neglect to try to reconcile. Okay, what is science teaching us with? what the Bible teaches us. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we've got a history of bad mistakes doing yeah. that. Yeah. Right. So I don't think it's an either or it's, it's all God's truth, but not all of God's truth and mystery is revealed in the Bible. And he says that. Right. Exactly. No, I, I, I completely concur. As I said, I think to, it's a, the Bible is fantastic. The more you study it, the more you understand the language, the more you understand the history, the more you understand what's metaphor and what's be, to be taken literally, yeah. the more powerful it becomes. And then you take that and you take the NDEs, which are also a partial message. As you said, it's, it's a glimpse, you know, yeah. it's not a, it's not a full picture of what it's like once you cross that barrier. And we, but we add all these things together and we see how they're reconciled. And, you know, even the person of Jesus, which we don't have time to even get started on that right now, but it's fascinating to me how many people have no belief in Jesus and they see Jesus in their NDE. Oh, let uh, me tell you. Can I tell you one that's yeah, just fascinating yeah, to me? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so I mean, you know, I told you Howard Storm, but when I was I was on um, Megyn Kelly, Fox, uh, when when Megyn Kelly was uh, big, and mm -hmm. uh, I have this lady reach out to me um, from Los Angeles, and she emails me and says. Hey, I saw you on Megyn Kelly, and I don't know who you are. I've never read your book, but that happened to me. I was talking about Imagine Heaven and this, all this. Mm -hmm. and she said, when I was 16, um, I grew up in a, in a Jewish family. My father uh, and mother were atheist agnostics. But when I was 16, my horse landed on me and crushed me, mm. and I died, and Jesus was there with me. I've never told anyone that. Thanks. Mm. Wow. <laughs> That's all she said. Wow. And I was like, whoa. And so Heidi and I started talking. She's actually a, um, a hospice nurse now. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, we, we started talking and it's, yeah, it's amazing. So even though her father told her, you know, you are no more significant than a speck of dust, you know, on the ground. And Jesus Christ is the biggest hoax ever foisted on humanity. So that's what she grew up with. Mm. But she said, and then quite honestly, it was kind of a, not a great family situation for mm -hmm. her. 
But she said, I always believed in God. And I, as a little girl, especially when things were difficult, I would pray to God at Mm. night. And I felt this peace. I felt this presence with me. Mm. Well, when the horse crushes her, she said she left her body. She's up 30 feet above, seeing her sisters freak out. But she's an incredible peace. And there's light comes over her right shoulder. And she turns and looks back and she said, it was Jesus Christ. Wow. Just as she would, you know, like the robe, the beard, everything. And she said, but I wasn't like, what's a good Jewish girl like me doing with a guy like a rabbi like you, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. cause you know, that, that wasn't supposed to be. She said, no, I knew him and I had always known him Yeah. and she knew he was God. Now here's what's fascinating. Jesus gives her a life review and in the life review, she sees herself in her room praying as a kid and Jesus is sitting there by her bed. Oh, wow. He wow. was showing her, he was the presence there with her. Wow. And she was praying and yeah. she always knew him. Yeah. Now that's totally unexpected, but I've had the same thing. I had a woman from Tehran in Farsi tell me how she came to faith in Christ as a, as a Muslim And it was when she had a near-death experience and the exact same thing, Jesus appears to her. Mm -hmm. And she comes back following Jesus. Yeah. Told me, told it to me in Farsi. (laughs) Wow. Wow. I know. It's, it's incredible. Well, I could talk to you all day. We probably should should end pretty soon. Um, Tell people where they can find out more about you, more about your book, your church, everything else. Well, Mm imagineheaven.net is uh, the website. Um, more about about imagine heaven uh gatewaychurch.com um and it's gateway church austin there are other gateway churches so we're not affiliated with with others i've had people go out and search gateway church and then they're they're disappointed because it doesn't allow doubts or questions or necessarily Mm -hmm. but um but we do and and so you know that's the environment we're trying to create so yeah we have an online um, campus as well. So people are welcome to check things out. Well, it's been fantastic getting to meet you and, and to see your enthusiasm and your love for people and the way you're sharing this, this, I think, very important message that is, I think, really needed right now. So uh, it's been an honor. Thank you very much for being here today. Thanks for having me on the podcast, Brian. All right. Have a great rest of your day. So that does it for another episode of Grief to Growth. I sure hope you enjoyed it. If you like this content, make sure you subscribe. So click on the subscribe button here and then click on the bell to receive notifications and click on all. That way you'll be notified whenever I release new content. Thanks for watching and have a great day.